can open up your Bibles to uh, Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 2, uh, 15 to 17. And then we're going to go over to Genesis chapter 3, <coughs> verses 6 to 13. Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over him. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are surely to die. And then chapter 3, starting in verse 6. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its, fr and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give, give, it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open, and they were suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, It was the woman who gave me, who gave me, who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I hate it. So my message is entitled, The God Who Pursues. And that's going to be the theme over the, over the month of, of April, is we're going to really look at how God pursues us. So it's the God who pursues us. Father, we humble ourselves before you this morning. And we thank you, Father, for, for how you love each one of us so very much. That you pursue us. Father, you are concerned about everything that we do. You're concerned about the pain and the hurt. You're concerned about the struggles that we have. Father, this morning we ask for you to open our minds and our hearts and our eyes and our ears to, to your voice today. To your word this morning. Father, that we can have understanding just how much you love us. And how much you desire the best for us. Father, we ask for your for your anointing upon your word that is spoken from me this morning. Father, I pray that you will clear out absolutely everything on my mind and my heart that I may have. And Lord, I want to make sure that what I say comes directly from you. Father, just touch each one of us now by the power of your Holy Spirit. Pursue us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So where are you? This is an important question to think about. It's especially significant to contemplate the first time it appears in human history. God directs a question to Adam to force the man to gaze deeply at himself and to see what God already knew. The occasion takes place in the Garden of Eden. After providing abundantly for all human needs, God gave the man and the woman one negative command. They were not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord says that in, verse, in verses 16 and, and 17. He said, actually in 15, The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden ten and watched over it. But the Lord God warned them, you may, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you eat of its fruit and are sure to die. You see, in here, God was really just to see how, how obedient Adam was. See, they gave him, out of all the commandments and all the things that God said to Adam and Eve, he gave him one specific to say, look, don't eat from that tree. You know, previously to that, he said, I'm going to give you all that you, you can eat out. Everything else is out there. It's all yours, all in abundance, but don't eat from that one tree. And he was just wanted to see if, if, how obedient Adam was. You see, when God understood and what the couple could not possibly understand before their failure to obey, 
was that they knew only the good and had no understanding of evil. After they ate, they grasped the meaning of evil as well. That knowledge would banish their power to opt for the good. They became sinners, and their perfect world crashed. The Creator had promised that by their disobedience, they would know evil. And now they did. In realizing what evil was, they had no power to help themselves. They were trapped with the knowledge of the facts and their inability to do anything to make themselves right with God. From that time on, the Bible declares that all human beings are sinners from the moment of birth. Most of us Christians have no trouble acknowledging this. We were hesitant to admit that innate human sin always guides us to choose evil. We can soften this and say we are self-centered or concerned more about our, our needs than anything else. You see, when we have sin in our life, it takes, it takes control of us. I mean, I look at all of the broken men that come into Wings as Eagles and all of the struggles that they, you know, they have in life and, and that they continue to have while they're, while they're with us because they have a hard time in understanding the lifestyle that they came from. That, that choice of life that they that they chose, that they were living, and that they wanted to get, you know, how do I get free of that? That's that's my life. You know, and and they struggle with it, as we struggle with it, as I, as I struggle with it. I struggle with it all the time. I'm not perfect. I'm far from being perfect. Jesus is the only one that's perfect. But when we let sin enter our lives, as, as it happened with Adam and Eve in the scriptures that we read, sin entered their life. All of a sudden, what they thought was, was good, all of a sudden turned into bad. And we need to, to put that hedge of protection around us so that we don't let sin into our lives. And, and I mean, one thing we need to continue to do is pray for our elders that we just, we just appoint it. Because they are going to be under attack. We always are. When we take a step of faith, when God encourages, you know, calls us and, and moves us out. We need to continue to pray. And that's why prayer in this church is so vitally important. And I encourage each one of you to continue to pray for the leadership team. Because if, if, Satan, if, sin is, if Satan is going to tear the dwelling place down, if sin, Satan is going to tear down wings as eagles, he's going to do it from the top up, or from the top down. So be encouraged to continue to pray for, for the leadership of, of well, wings as eagles. I covet those prayers, but also the leadership here at the dwelling place. Because we need to make sure that our lives um, don't aren't are, are covered in prayer, because sin can hit us just as much as it can hit anybody else. Here are a few scriptures that speak of our human condition. Let's look at Psalm 14, verse number three. Psalm 14, verse number three. And it says, "But but no, all have turned away." All have become corrupt. No one does good, not a single one. No one but God is perfect. All of us stand, all of us stand guilty before Him and need His forgiveness. No matter how well we perform or how much we achieve compared to others, none of us can, can boast of His or her goodness when compared to God's standard. God only expects us to obey His laws. But he wants us to love him with all of our heart. No one except Jesus Christ has done that perfectly. Because we all fall short. We must turn to Christ to save us. You see, it is so important. So important for us to love the Lord Jesus Christ. To realize how much he loves us. That he reached down into that miry pit. And he pulled each and every one of us out. And he set us upon our rocks. And on that rock stands Solomon's. On that rock stands Jesus Christ. And that's where our life is built, is upon that rock. And we just, you know, we need, some of us have a hard time fathoming just how much God loves us. Like, I know it took me a while. Lord, how can you love me for what I've, you know, put my family through, what I've put, you know, my wife through, what I've put myself through, what I've put all those people, you know, through in my life? You know, He loves us. He loves us unconditionally. 
And when we can understand that, and we can really grab a hold of the love that He has for each one of us, to realize that, that we are precious in His eyes. His Word says, precious stones. Like every one of the guys that come in to Wings as Eagles are precious stones. Everyone that comes into the Dwelling Place Church are precious stones. They're precious in the eyes of, of, of God. But you see, in the world, they're not precious. In the world, you're, you know, you're a scum, you're a, you know, you're a, a no-gooder, you're up to nothing. You know, nobody loves you in the world. They, all they want to do is they want to use you and, and use you and abuse you and kick you out. That's not who God is. God loves us. And God understands. God understands when we make mistakes. God understands when we fall down. You know, I'll never forget there's an individual, and I have to... Because we're on, on YouTube now and, and stuff, I have to watch same names, so I can't quote people's names, so certain deacons are going to be blessed now because they're <laughs> on YouTube. But there was a certain individual that I was working with uh, for quite a number, you know, and I worked with this individual for over 30 days. And this individual stumbled and fell. I took it personally. I said, Lord, what did I do wrong? God said, you did nothing wrong. He said, you just got to pick them up and dust them up and run. You see, and when sin enters our lives, that's what God wants to do to each one of us. He is pursuing us. He is watching over us. He is loving us. So when we get into that situation where sin, where we've done something wrong, and, and hey, we will. We will. We need to humble ourselves before God. And we need to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And He'll pick you back up. And He'll dust you off. And He'll love you. He won't point a finger at you. He won't condemn you. He won't shake His head and say, Oh, man, not again. How many times do I have to take you through this before you're going to realize? He's just going to pick you up and say, Ron, I love you. I don't mind my name being on YouTube. I'm not going to sue the dwelling place. <laughs> but when God does that, when God pours out His love upon us, it is such a blessing. It's the in Romans 3, verses 10 to 18. It says in the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. You see, all through this, it talks about people who lie. It talks about people who, who, who say bad words or, and who basically give us a curse. You know, they, they beat us up and they spit us out with their words. And that's what the world is all about. I know when I was in the world, you know, not, not very, very... Seldom did I ever hear anybody say, say positive words to me. It was always, oh yeah, there he goes again. He's going back to jail. Look at that alcohol. Look at that drug addict. You know, look at him. Look at that ex-con. You know, all of these negative words. And that's the way the world is. We struggle with, with bitterness. <clears throat> we struggle with anger. But you know... When we have the fear of God in us. In other words, not being afraid of God, but loving God for who He is. At the recovery center, we re I really try to teach them in, and, and the other volunteers and mentors that come in, we really try to teach them not to be afraid of God, but to love God. Because He loves us so much that He gave His Son to die on the cross for us. So that all of our sins, all of our old lifestyle, could be nailed to the cross and he raise up the third day and live so we could live 
and He can live inside of us. And we really need to, to just give God that love back. My own personal life. I said to God one very one day, and He just flashed me back to that day I was in that prison cell, that bear creek. I was down on my knees and I was crying out to Him. I just said, Lord, I don't want to do anything that's going to hurt the relationship I have with You. I love You so much. I love You so much. When I said those few words to Him. He continues to pour his love on them. He continues to pour them, pour them, pour them. And I said, Lord, I'm sick and tired of living that lifestyle. I don't like living it anymore. And he just reached down and he pulled me out and set me upon his rock. It hasn't been easy. There's been struggles, many struggles. But you know, he's always there for me. He understands when I make mistakes. Because we are. We're going to make them. And then he says, it's okay, Lord. I love you. And we're going to get through this. Now look at the many times I've heard those words. Ron, I love you. And we're going to make it through. I just... I say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you do in my life. It's because every day, every day, as his word says in Romans 6, 23, every day we need to die to self. We need to die to that stinking world, that stinking person that lives in that world. Because all it's going to end up doing is, is get us into trouble and get us into... You know, back into that old lifestyle. As I tell the guys at the recovery center, I, you know, I say, as long, you know, you need to stay focused. You need to keep your eyes on Jesus. You need to get rid of that control that you have. It's, it's your way or the highway. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, it's going to be the highway if you don't turn your control over to God. Yes. Because you are going to go to hell. In a handout. Guaranteed or a shadow of it. But when we turn that control over to God and say, Lord, you know, as... Carrie Underwood sings that song, Jesus Take the Wheel. You know, when we let Jesus take the wheel of our life, we are, are, have nothing more, nothing but blessing <coughs> and strength in our lives. But we need a, it's a daily thing. We just can't do it today and expect five years from now that you know, it's still going to be the same because it's not. It's a daily walk with the Lord. A daily walk. Unfortunately, people, in the, you know, people think that they can... You know, they can just do it on Sunday. And then the rest of the week, they're okay. You know, I'm, at, ah, I'm okay. You know, I went to church on Sunday, and I don't need to pray. I don't need to read my Bible. You know, God, when we pray, when we spend time reading His Word, He pulls things out and shows us things that just amazed me. There was a question that I asked the Lord, and I'd read the scripture over and over and over and over again. And on Saturday morning, I was reading the scripture, and all of a sudden, the answer that I asked the Lord jumped up. That's why it's so important for us to spend time in prayer, spend time reading God's Word. Let's go back to Genesis chapter number 3. There's three questions in there that we're going to take a look at that the Lord um, was asking. But first of all, we're going to look at verse 7 of Genesis 3. And it says, at, what mo at that moment their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. You see, in stark language, the Bible gives the result of Adam and Eve's disobedience. This statement is, in verse 7 does not portray God holding the mirror to their eyes, at least not quite. But the action has begun because of their failure. 
Their disobedience results in a sudden realization. Hey, we are naked. Have they been naked all along? Apparently so. But now the awareness of their condition flooded their mind and shame came over them. Why else would they take the next step of covering their bodies in, in that second part of verse 7? So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. They were afraid and they were ashamed, so they tried to hide themselves. The awful awareness of their new sinful condition. They feared, along, although the Bible does not mention the object of the fear, so we can only assume that they feared that God would punish them. Now their minds had embraced sin and evil. Fear and worry and anxiety surely marched in as well. Certainly when we realize we've done wrong, fear of punishment scores rather high. You see, when sin enters into our life, our conscience takes over. You see, we know the difference between right and wrong. We know what we should be doing what we shouldn't be doing. But all of a sudden, when that sin gets into our lives, all of a sudden, guilt takes over. Shame takes over. Remorse takes over. Pain takes over. And regret takes over in our lives. I mean, over the years of, of ministry that God has blessed me with, you know, I don't need to have somebody tell me when somebody is, has maybe slipped and, and got back into their addictions. I just need to look at them and you can see all of that. You can see the shame. You can see the remorse. You can see the guilt. So instead of me going over and saying, oh yeah, you did it again, didn't you? What happened this time? Instead, you wrap your arms around them and you love them. And you love them. To the point where they say, oh, hey, he does love me. And then there's going to be breakthrough. There's going to be breakthrough. Same thing here in this church. I don't want any one of you to, if something happens and, you know, and, and a situation in your life is not good, I don't want you to quit coming to church. I want you to get a hold of me. I want you to come in. I want you to see it, sit down with me. Because we're going to love you. We're going to walk through with you. We're going to walk this walk. And as I, you know, the Lord really showed me a, a while ago in, in the book of Matthew. And the scripture says that he walks with us right through, right from start to finish. Never, God never, Jesus never gave up on anybody. There's only one that he gave up on, not the same. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. And as I share with people, when they come into Wings of Eagles, or when I, when I share with them in the coffee shops or on the streets, I said, I'm in this for the duration with you. It doesn't matter how good or how bad things happen in your life. We're not going to give up on it. You see, the pursuer does the same thing. He doesn't give up on us. He just keeps loving us and is always there for us. You see, in Genesis chapter 3 and verses 8 through 13, there are, there are three questions. The first question we're going to look at is verse number 9, and the word says, Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? The second question we're going to look at is, who told you? And the third question is, what have you done? You see, the first question, where are you? The answer is, I'm right here, Lord. Right in my sinless, sinful, faithless actions, I'm right here. You see, that's why it's so important for us to be very transparent in everything that we do. Admit our shortfalls. Admit when we're weak. Admit when we've got struggles. Because when we're transparent, then we don't give Satan any opportunity to, to get at us. So I want to encourage each one of you this morning 
to be very transparent in everything that you do. If you've got a struggle in your life, be transparent with it. If you don't want to come to me, that's fine. Go to somebody else in the church and share it with them. But be very transparent. Because that's when you have victory. That's when you have victory. The next question is, who told you? Because God endows us with a sense of self-awareness. Part of it functions is to enable us to accept our failures and weaknesses. You see, here is where God really starts pursuing us. When we go to Him and, and we say, Lord, I've got this problem. Well, well, who told you? Well, somebody, you know, somebody in the church may, mentioned it to me. And, and that's why it's so vitally important for us to have mentors in our lives. People that come up to us and they can encourage us and they can, they can say, hey, you got a problem. Then you can go to the Lord and you can say, Lord, I need your guidance. I need your wisdom. So important for us to have that relationship, relationship with Christ. That when somebody says something to us, we can go to Him. And we can say, Lord, guide me through this struggle. Some of you have heard the, the testimony of one of our other uh, deacons and brother in Christ about how this individual was set free from fear. And this fear that he, you know, had gone on in his life for quite a while, fear of abandonment, and just how God set him free. You see, when we go to, when we go to the Lord, he helps us. He helps us. And the third question I want to look at is, what have you done? What have you done? You see, when, when we go to the Lord, we have to be willing to, to have breakthrough. There was a situation in my life on, on, uh, on Monday. There was a major breakthrough in, in my life, in my family's life, with my wife and myself. One of the struggles that I that I have is sometimes my you know with my wife's disability and, and sometimes she forgets things and forgets how to do things and, and I lose you know I I lose it and my one of my one of my concerns and one of my prayers to the Lord is Jesus I want to be like you inside my house and outside my house and I have no problem being like Jesus outside my house. Inside is another situation, another struggle I have. And my wife and myself had a had an argument on, on Monday, and again, it's, you know, it's not who my wife is, it's a disability she has, but it, it can be a struggle, it can be a real struggle. And I raised my voice, and, and uh, I didn't get any peace from it, but I, I I had to go and I left and I came to the church on Monday afternoon and the inside of my stomach was just in a knot. And I just I just spent time in the Lord in prayer. And God told me what I needed to do. He said, when you get home, you need to ask your wife for forgiveness. And then you need to ask her how you need to, what I need to do. And so when I got home, I said to my wife, I said, Bonnie, I said, please forgive me. For how I acted this morning. I said, I didn't mean it. I said, when I say those, those words then, and I raise my voice at you, then I see that you get into a shell and, and things I've asked you to do, you don't do. And again, I'm not trying to control my wife, it's just her, what I have to I have to give her some guidance every day as to what needs to be done. And she accepted my forgiveness. And I said to her, I said, Bonnie, I said, how would you like me to talk to you? And she said, like Jesus. <laughs> well, I mean, I've been asking the Lord that I wanted to be like him beside me all the way. <laughs> out, of my, out of the mouth of my wife says to be like Jesus. But you know, there's been total 
peace in our house for four days. Just everything in her life has been much better. Everything in my life has been much better. See, because I did something about it. When the Lord showed me what to do, I did it. You know, I didn't continue on. And that's why I want to encourage you this morning. Because you see, the point of the question, just as when originally asked, is to force us to gaze deeply within and to see our nakedness and hence our sinfulness. Then we can give the proper answers to God and ourselves. And when we, then we can move on. You see, and that's the divine purpose that God has in our lives is, is to peel away and to peel away all those struggles in our lives. I know the Lord didn't like to see what was happening in my home. You know, when I left on Monday night to go to, to Bible study at uh, one of our places, if you guys don't mind your names being spoken of, we went to Dave, Dave Clark's house. On the way down the hill, from our holy hill, I live up in Panorama there, and we, we have that hill circle, and there's four of us that are, are, are Christians, and we have the whole block covered, we call it the holy hill. So as I was coming down the holy hill, I said, Lord, how come it's always me? <laughs> It was always me that you changed. Why don't you change body? <laughs> it's always me. I guess because I'm the one that needs it. She does it. But you see, that's how much he loves us. That's how much when he pursues us that he wants to change us each and every day. I'm not that same person I was 20 years ago. I'm not the same person I was yesterday. Because he continues to peel away and continues to put his love within us and continues to pursue us. And that's why it's so important for his church, so important for us to be transparent in everything that we do. You know, at, um, at one time, you know, when people would ask me, how's your wife doing? I would say, oh, she's doing great. You know, but actually it was, you know, she was struggling. And uh, so then when I started sharing and being transparent about the struggles, you know, getting more people to pray for my wife, and, and it just makes it so much easier for me, so much more easier for me. And so I want to encourage you this morning that when, when you feel God pursuing you, and He pursues you each and every day, I want to encourage each one of you to be transparent in everything. In everything. The only time we're going to be perfect is when God finally calls us all home. So if you're in this, on this, in the kingdom right now, in the world right now, to try to be perfect, you're far from it. And if anybody that walks around and thinks they are perfect, then they need to humble themselves and they need to pray. They need to seek the face of God because nobody's perfect. We all have struggles, every single one of us. Every single one of us. You know, and that's what makes it Living in the kingdom is such a blessing. And that's what makes living in the kingdom such a blessing. And somebody was sharing with me earlier this week. They were saying, Pastor Ron, because you're so transparent, that people feel comfortable around you. They feel comfortable coming to you with problems in their lives. Because they realize that you're no different than they are. And there isn't any one of us in this church that are any different than any one of us. That's why when we stood up here as, as, your lead, as a leadership, I, I just felt led to let you know that there's nothing different between, you know, between us, between me and, you know, and everybody else. We're all part of the kingdom of God. But you see, God asks relentlessly, it seems, in fact, I suspect that's why we constantly have the penetrating question thrown at us. If we listen and hear the divine intention, and it takes courage for us to do this, we are a little farther down the yellow brick road towards heaven than if we insist on being the asker. Could it be that God asks us so that we are forced to look at ourselves? 
Isn't it a distinct possibility that God wants us to say, I am naked and hid from you? See, in that worship song that we sang in there about him gazing at us, that's what he does each and every day. I mean, I, <laughs> I look at, at one of my little, one of my little dogs, Oreo, and at times she just, I sit in my chair and, and she just sits there and she just looks at me and she just gazes at me. You know, and, and I know that's what our that's what our father, that's what our papa's doing. Our papa's sitting in his big easy chair and he's just looking at us and he's just he's just gazing at us. You know, and, and I go this way and Oreo follows me this way and I go this way and she follows me that way. That's what God does. God follows us. He loves us so much that he gazes at us. And continues to keep his eyes focused on us. But you see, each one of us need to change, change our lives. We need to have life-changing experiences. In closing this morning, I want us to look at Psalm 139. <clears throat> and in particular, verses 23 and 24. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That is a scripture the Lord put upon my heart over well, 20 years ago. That's a scripture I pray every morning. Lord, search me. Search me. Oh God, and know my heart today. Test me and know my thoughts. And if there's any wicked way in me, Lead me in the way everlasting for today. You see, and it's our heart. It's our heart that God wants to change. He says in 143, verse 10, Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on a firm foot. See, that needs to be our heart's desire this morning. Is we need to say, Lord, I need my heart changed. I need my heart changed and get rid of all of the stuff that's in my heart that, that I don't like and, and I want to have that relationship with you. I want you to pursue me in a way that you've never pursued me before. Lord, I'm willing and I'm ready. I want you to gaze at me. I want you to gaze at me. And I want you to pour out your love upon me. I want you, Lord, to be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in my life. And I know I'm a, I'm a sinner and I know what I've done is not right in the eyes of the world. But you love me for who I am. And I want to change my life. I want to change my heart.